rain threatens to end a race early. It produces some of the best racing that we see in NASCAR, and that is exactly what happened in Atlanta. Let's talk about the race. William Byron captured his fourth win of the season at Atlanta Motor Speedway in a rain-shortened race. He becomes the winningest driver of 2023. Funny enough, this is Goodyear's 2000th win with NASCAR. If we look back at the 1000th win, Jeff Gordon was the driver who won that at Bristol Motor Speedway, I believe, in 1995. So repeating history here with the 24, we already had that instance Earlier this year, when we went to Darlington for the throwback weekend, William Byron throwing it back to the Chrome Illusion car celebrating NASCAR's 50th anniversary. This year, NASCAR celebrates its 75th anniversary. Byron kind of threw back that scheme, but kind of reinvented it to celebrate the 75th anniversary of NASCAR. So two instances where the 24 cars consistently in the history books for kind of the same reason. So pretty cool for William Byron and I guess Jeff Gordon in this case. Around lap 79, Byron let off the gas. He got a little loose and then made contact with Corey LaJoy from there. We knew it was going to be an uphill battle for William Byron. Did I think he would win the race at that point? Absolutely not. But when we had a late race caution for Ryan Priest, the field kind of flipped on strategy. There was a lot of drivers that didn't go to pit road, decided to stay out and kind of have that threat of rain looming over. They were like, okay, we have to stay out. We don't have a choice. Other drivers, though, really didn't have a choice, whether it was a tire reason, a fuel reason, and had to go to pit road. A lot of those were the leading cars. And though the threat of rain loomed over, they, again, did not have a choice. So it gave a lot of these drivers an advantage to stay out on the track. And one of those drivers that took advantage of that was William Byron. Big talking point after this race, let's just get it out of the way, is the call that NASCAR made to end this race a little shorter than we would have liked. Uh, and at first off, I don't envy the call that NASCAR had to make. It was going to rain. It started to rain. We didn't want to have an instance where we held out way too long, put the cards back on the track. We went racing and we had a Daytona situation like last year. And then we had even like a New Hampshire Motor Speedway situation when Eric Almirola won the race. Of course, he won it because there were no lights at the track. The sun was going down. But we ended up starting that race knowing that the track conditions were slick and we had cars spin out for no reason. That was a really bad day for Joe Gibbs Racing and with that happening, but I knew NASCAR didn't want another situation like that. So what bothered me though, from the fan perspective, watching at home and not knowing how close the weather actually was to the track, was when we decided to call the race or how long we decided to do caution laps. The cars paraded around the track for about 13 to 14 minutes under caution before NASCAR brought them to pit road and through the yellow. From a fan perspective at home, my thought was like, okay, why can't we just run maybe four laps under green and then call it good? I felt like we could have really gone back racing because let's be honest, this was some of the best racing I think we've seen all season, kind of even maybe like all of last year. This, this race was so solid and we'll talk about that later, but I truly thought we could have gone back to green. One of my buddies, Jonathan Field, did fill me in on kind of the procession of decision making here. NASCAR and the officials said, hey, want to go for the drivers. And as they went to want to go, they saw rain coming into turn one and they waved off that restart as they kept doing caution laps, kind of to see what the rain in turn one was doing. We got rain on the back stretch and in turn three. And at that point, NASCAR made the decision to bring the cars to pit road, making a red flag race, and then calling everything off and declaring William Byron the winner. Again, going back to the past, I understand why NASCAR made this decision and I do respect the fact that they were overly cautious here. We don't wanna tear up cars for a bad reason and this would have been a bad reason to tear up cars knowing that we had rain coming into the track and track conditions would have been less than perfect. But the fan in me hates this call because I wanted to see more racing. There were so many interesting storylines that were working their way to the front. The racing was spectacular, uh, but also knowing that safety comes first, I respect this decision because safety has been a big topic with these Gen 7 cars and just in general too in NASCAR, safety is always the number one priority. So NASCAR made this the number, number one priority last night. Uh, so I respect it. Uh, we're going to move on though. I know that everyone's going to have different opinions on this, but I will say though, the threat of rain and that last caution really mixed up pit strategies, mixed up who we saw at the front of the field and who ended up finishing in the top 10. So let's talk about our results. 
first William Byron, second we have Daniel Suarez, could have made it a three-peat win for Trackhouse, unfortunately was not able to get to the lead. Again, I think if we did have one final restart, if NASCAR was able to get it in, I think Suarez could have capitalized on it, but it's something that we will never know. Unfortunately, Daniel Suarez was the only one who was able to try to make this a three-peat for Trackhouse. Ross Chastain was involved in a wreck around lap 123, and he did not finish this race. So very unfortunate there, but perhaps they can capitalize coming up at Loudoun. In the third position, we have AJ Allmendinger. I'm gonna bring it back to the Xfinity race where Colic was really close to getting that win. I, I will say, lack of lack of better words, they, they blew the win in Xfinity series, but they had two of their cars in the top 10 following that race. So that was really good for them. But AJ, uh, a top five day, really solid. Even then Justin Haley within the top 10, he finished in the eighth position during the cup race. This is Justin Haley's fifth top 10 of the season, so kind of an underdog driver. We haven't really talked about him a lot this season, but putting in consistent results in that college equipment. But going back to the fourth position, we have Michael McDowell. Fifth, we have Kyle Busch. Sixth, Brad Keselowski. And for me, this one hurts a little bit because he was so close to getting the win. As always, I like to scour the internet, see what opinions we can get from the crews and drivers. And Matt Weaver had an excellent interview with Matt McCall, who is the crew chief for Brad Keselowski. He said it didn't matter if they stayed out following that caution, that Ryan Priest caution. They were short a few laps. So unfortunate there. I guess regardless, we weren't going to see a Brad Keselowski win this weekend. But we do have an opportunity coming up. I would say Michigan's a decent opportunity for Brad. Also looking ahead to Daytona, which is the cutoff race before we get into the playoffs. Brad is in a good points position, so we're going to look at the points in a little bit. So nothing to worry about there for right now, but it would be nice to see Brad break his winless streak. In seventh, a Rick Ware racing car. How about that? JJ Yaley finishes in the seventh position. He decided to stay out, or the crew made the call for him to stay out following that caution, and it really paid off for that team. So Solid run for J.J. Gailey. He was able to hold his own, too. As we mentioned, Justin Haley in the 8th position, ninth Blaney, and 10th Ricky Stenhouse Jr. Two drivers that I have to note here that did not have good finishes. Kyle Larson did not finish this race. He was involved in a wreck, and then they tried to fix some damage. They put on a tire. The tire blew up on pit road. It was, it was a bad day for Kyle Larson, who was otherwise having a solid run in Stage 1. He actually finished second in the stage. He was kind of shaking off that super speedway racing type of rust. I know that Atlanta is not technically a super speedway, but it's super speedway like in style and feel. And Larson was running really well until all of that happened. So that sucked for Kyle Larson. And then Martin Truex Jr. looking at him and his day. He had the fastest car, in my opinion, on Sunday. He was able to make moves happen that other drivers weren't. And he was really solid on that high line, trying to get speed and gain speed off of that to get around cars. Unfortunately, though, he was involved in that wreck with Brian Priest that ended his day in the 29th position, which was which was awful because he had the potential to win. It's just how the cautions fell and everything worked out with rain. Did not go Martin Truex Jr.'s way. Now let's look at your points standing. Something interesting about this Atlanta race is that drivers who desperately needed solid points days did not get those. So it shook things up around that cutoff line. Starting with Ryan Blaney, at least above the cutoff line, he moves from ninth in the point standings to seventh in the playoff grid. Harvick maintains his 12th position on the playoff grid, but he goes from plus 151 to the good to plus 126 after the bad day that he had, which is very unfortunate because this was his last race at Atlanta, of course, where he got his first Cup Series win. That pace lap that they did before the race with RC in the 29 and him, of course, in the number four Ford going side by side was really emotional. Um, I will say I when I joined the sport, I was a really big Kevin Harvick fan, of course, wearing the Harvick shirt paying homage to his last start at Atlanta. Uh, so I really wanted him to have a good day. Unfortunately, he did not. And it knocked him back in points a little bit, but he does maintain that 12th position on the playoff grid. This meant that Busher and Kozlowski could catch up. Busher plus 102, Kozlowski plus 100. Around the cut line, there are different names in the mix. Remember last week, Ty Gibbs and Bubba Wallace were above that cutoff line, but because of the bad days that they had, Bubba Wallace did get some stage points. Ty Gibbs did not. They are now below that cutoff line. And who moves above it? Daniel Suarez and Michael McDowell. If you're shocked about Michael McDowell being above the cutoff line on points right now, you should not be. I've been sprinkling his name into every single episode that we've done this season so far on above the line. We've talked about his consistency. Like any driver, he might have a bad weekend, 
but he's had one of the best seasons of his career. He had it last year, continuing this year, and I think he could actually point his way into the playoffs. We have uh, road courses coming up in the schedule. We have a super speedway coming up in Daytona for the cutoff race. His bread and butter is coming up on the schedule. Would not be shocked again if he makes it into the playoff on points alone, so keep an eye out for that 34 team of Michael McDowell. Suarez and McDowell are plus three to the good, while Bubba Wallace is minus three. Almendinger makes up some points. He is now only minus 13. Ty Gibbs, of course, like I said, not getting any stage points, having a pretty not so great day, is now minus 26 to the good. And finally, keeping an eye on Chase Elliott, he is minus 60 to the good, did not make up a lot of ground. Last thing we have to talk about besides the drivers is the track itself, the quality of the product that we saw. And I will say, Oh my God, this race was fantastic. The, the product that this new reconfiguration has done to Atlanta Motor Speedway has boosted what we have seen at this track in the past few years. It has been incredible. Marcus Smith, SMI, like job well done. I will say this has to be one of my favorite races to look forward to every single year. Literally, these cars can go anywhere they want on the track. Any groove seems to work really well. I mean, it obviously depends on the car setup and what the drivers have to work with there. But literally, if you want to run the high line, the low line, anything in between, you're able to make it work. And something really interesting about this super speedway like track is that if you have a run in one corner and you're not able to capitalize it, you don't have to worry about it because the next corner you can get another run and capitalize on it. That's something different than what we see at Daytona and Talladega where you're having to wait a little bit longer for these runs to kind of play out. With Atlanta, it's like back and forth um, every single turn. It's very, very exciting. Of course, what's unique about this event was the threat of rain really playing out the strategies on pit row. These crew chiefs were really on their toes. These drivers were on their toes as well. They were fighting for every single position they could get on every single lap because you never knew when the rain was going to actually come in. They raced this race like every single lap was the last one of this event. And that was very thrilling to watch. It kept things a little chaotic, but not necessarily chaotic. I guess a little thrilling on the edge of your seat. And those are the type of races that I love to see. So for that reason alone, uh, this for me was the best race all season by far. Uh, I, I feel weird giving a race a 100%, uh, but I'm going to give this one a 99. Uh, I think this, I don't know if this is the highest rated race I've had in the past two years or whatever, uh, but really, really good job by everyone involved. Uh, it was one of the best races I have seen, one of the most exciting races I have seen in the bit for NASCAR. That is it with Atlanta. I do want to mention Mid-Ohio real quick. I was there on the ground reporting for tobychristy.com and above the yellow line. I was thrilled to be there. Got to talk to a lot of great drivers. I got to meet a lot of you and I got to meet a lot of great folks within the industry. So I want to say a big thank you to Toby Christy for the opportunity and a major thank you to NASCAR and Mid-Ohio for putting on a great event. Keep an eye on the truck series around that cutoff line for them going into the playoffs. Really, really interesting. They are very close on points there. Congrats to Corey Heim for winning that race from the pole to the victory. So very, very exciting for him. The ARCA race won by Tyler Ankrum was also really exciting too. He had a great press conference. Um, I was there for that and that was really fun to watch. So congrats to Tyler Ankrum as well. Next race, I might be at Michigan. So keep an eye on that. Excited to have that opportunity, that potential opportunity to report for the Xfinity Series and the Cup Series. But Mid-Ohio, that was a blast. I hope to go back next year. So fingers crossed crossed, but a really cool experience. Looking ahead to our race at Loudoun, a reminder that Loudoun falls under the wet weather package that NASCAR has created. If there's some damp weather conditions, NASCAR is able to run on those wet weather tires at that track, so be aware of that if we have weather in the area. Following that race next week, we're going to have some testing, trying to test some short track packages, trying to maybe make things a little bit better on that side of things. We'll have drivers represented from each manufacturer there. So it should be a good day to get some vital information to make this short track package a little bit better than what we have right now. All this means we're going to have a lot of great content coming up. And this week on the live stream on the Toby Christie Com channel at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we're going to have a guest from Team Penske. So stay tuned for that. It's one you're going to want to join. So again, on the Toby Christie Com YouTube and Facebook pages, make sure to give us a follow there at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And of course, for more content from us here at Above the Yellow Line, make sure to follow our social media pages at underscore Taylor Kitchen underscore on Twitter and TikTok and at Above the Yellow Line on threads, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. I guess that's it for this episode. Uh, thank you all so much for your support and until next time, I'll see ya. Bye. Want to watch more great NASCAR content? Make sure to watch the videos on the screen and click the link below.